Um, want to cover two main main things as it relates to international students. One, the organized competition legislation in 14.2, and also what you do about a international transfer. Um, certainly, understand when I was on campus, the second you have an international transfer as opposed to a domestic transfer, your blood pressure starts to raise, heart starts racing. Um, I get that, but it does not need to be that way. So we're going to just walk through kind of some analysis points of how to get yourself through those situations. Um, so with organized competition, the general rule is that once a student, ath prospective student athlete, excuse me, graduates from high school, they have one calendar year, which essentially we call a grace period, to do to continue to play in organized competition. Okay, so maybe they're participating on a club team back home, um, whatever the case may be, they can continue to play golf tournaments, tennis tournaments during that first year after high school. Once that one year has elapsed, there's either an expectation that the individual enrolls full time at a collegiate institution, or they cease participation in outside competition if they're not going to immediately enroll at a collegiate institution. Obviously, the intent here is to provide some flexibility. Maybe the individual is still trying to figure out, particularly in the case of international students, do they want to come to America? Do they want to turn pro? What do they want to do? Maybe got, we're late in the game in terms of a recruiting process. So again, that one year grace period is meant to be exactly that, kind of a buffer to get their house in order, but not provide them unlimited opportunity to continue to participate in their sport, come to your institution as a 28-year-old tennis player who's been playing tennis for eight years and not having to be in school. Okay, That's probably pretty, pretty basic. So how do we determine high school graduation. There's a couple scenarios. One, obviously if they graduate on time with their class, just as they're expected to do, just like in America, four-year educational system, whatever this particular country is modeled off of, that's their graduation date. But what happens if they graduate early or late? So if a, a prospect graduates early, they become a member of that class. So if they graduate in three years, they originally thought they were going to graduate in May of 2015. They were able to graduate in May of 2014. May of 2014 is their graduation date. It's what you've got to use for purposes of applying the organized competition legislation. Now, what happens if there's a delay in graduation? If the student is required to repeat an entire year, so not just one class, not one semester, an entire year, the student athlete becomes a member of that class and that's their graduation date. So using our same example, we thought the student was going to graduate in May 2015. Something happened, is required by the educational system to repeat a year, doesn't graduate until May of 2016. May of 2016 is that individual's graduation date for purposes of applying the organized competition legislation. We see fairly frequently a student is required to repeat one class. So supposed to graduate May of 15, failed French, had to take French again, was ultimately got the diploma in February of 2016. That's all well and good. That student only has three months left of their grace period. Because again, they were not required to repeat that entire academic year. This determination oftentimes initially does have to be made by you all on campus if the student hasn't gone through the eligibility center yet. But ultimately at the end of the day the eligibility center is responsible for determining the high school graduation date for all PSAs. But obviously the most complicated for all of you is going to be your internationals. So any questions on graduation date? The number one resource, if you're not familiar with it already, uh, every year, and it gets updated throughout the year, uh, the NCAA publishes what we refer to as the International Student Athlete Guide. It's available um, on the NCAA publication site, same place you can download an electronic manual um, or any other NCAA printed resource. And that document, which is reviewed um, and approved by the International Student Records Committee, which is made 
group of individuals from all three divisions who are experts in the area of international students. They review that and it ultimately contains virtually every country we have ever seen an NBA student athlete from. And what it does is for each country, it breaks down that country's educational system. It tells you how long it should take the individual to graduate. So whether it's a three year, a four year, maybe a five year. And it'll tell you the different types of documents you may see from that country. So like most of you in the room, I'm guessing, I only really have familiarity with English and some French. I think where most people start to panic is when they all of a sudden get a transcript from a language they've never even seen. So that's where this document or this guide is really helpful because even if you can't read Spanish, you can match a word in the International Student Records Guide to a word that's on the document the student athlete gave you. It's not the most scientific way to do it, but it can help you. And so what it'll show you is with, that, with the International Student Record Guide, blah, 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 International Student Athlete Guide, will tell you is Category One documents is defined as something that can help determine both the graduation date and verifies that the student athlete is going to meet initial eligibility requirements. So Category One documents are the best; they're the most helpful. They're going to tell you is, is that student on track to meet initial eligibility standards, and it goes all the way down to Category Four documents. Which category four documents, and we'll get to this in a little bit, tell you that this student is actually a transfer. So the document that you're looking at isn't even a high school document. It's a document from an institution of higher education. So it's really helpful and I encourage um, you all to, to become familiar with that, particularly if you see international students frequently. Another great resource is our Eligibility Center International staff. So they know a lot. They, they certify every incoming international freshman to meet initial eligibility standards. They are a small but mighty team. I think there are like five of them that do all of that work. So I think your head spins by having a handful come in each year. Imagine the thousands upon thousands that they look at. Um, but with that becomes significant expertise. So uh, feel free, their contact information is in the PowerPoint should you ever need to reach out to them specifically on an international student. So again, like all good rules, there are a couple of exceptions. So when we're talking about the one year grace period, if you have a student who served in either the US or Canadian Armed Services, why was Canada just added? So Simon Fraser. So we wanted to make sure we were inclusive of our new um, international member. So if you have a, a prospective student athlete who came into your institution more than one year after graduating from high school, so he's a, he or she exhausted that grace period and was participating in organized competition while in active duty, on active duty, in either the US or Canadian Armed Services, that individual did not trigger the organized competition legislation. Obviously, we want to make sure that our service men and women are not put in a bad spot when they choose to come back to an institution of higher education here. So it doesn't have to be organized or administered by the military. That is a change. So if they go do a, if you have a tr uh, an individual who does a Susan G. Komen 5K while they're in the military, that's fine and that participation can be exempted. National and international competition exception. This would be for your students who are competing at a very elite level. Um, Olympics, world championships, things like that. They essentially get a second grace here. So we want to ensure that student athletes have the opportunity to fully vet those dreams, participate as necessary um, without penalty. So if you have a student athlete, prospective student athlete coming to you who's participating in any of those types of events or tryout events to qualify to make a national team um, or whatever the international equivalent would be in that situation, that individual would get, again, that second grace year uh, from their date of high school graduation. 
So I know we only have a handful of compliance people in the room and, and a lot of you are um, on campus, but do want to walk through the waiver guidelines for organized competition. So if you have an individual um, who you know, really didn't participate in a whole lot of competition, if all of a sudden they're getting caught up by the rule and, all of a, and you're looking at the fact that, hey, this kid played in two tennis matches and now all of a sudden you're going to tell me that the student has to sit a year and lose a year, that seems pretty harsh. We agree. So if you have a student who has participated in no more than 10% of the bylaw 17 maximum per the sport, um, or two dates, two contests or dates of competition, that individual would not be penalized for their participation. So again, this is really minimal participation. They're not getting an advantage, and this relief would actually be automatically applied by the eligibility center staff. So good news for you, you wouldn't even have to do any paperwork for that. Um, and the thing to note here is if you have a student, let's say, graduated from high school in 2012, no, it's 2010. So graduates in May 2010. So May 10 to May 11 is the grace here. So 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14. They've been hanging out for three years, not enrolling at your institu any institution, and come to you and follow 14. And over the last three years, that individual has participated in six tennis dates of competition over that time frame you're still in a good, in good spot there because it's an average of two per year of the delay. That makes sense to folks? <coughs> okay. Um, but for a student who doesn't meet that streamlined review, the Committee for Legislative Relief has a number of guidelines as it relates to organized competition. Um, the first note, we, we hear the argument a lot of, it was just a pickup game. They rented some space, field in Brazil, they, 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 that's a bad example, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of space to be had in Brazil right now. Um, let's, Chile, okay, they were down in Chile, and the student athlete, prospective student athletes, buddies, played in, played in this league, and all, all they were were these little pennies. I mean, they were hand-me-downs, they weren't even anything that great. Um, and this league was just really low caliber. He wasn't getting anything out of it. The argument that the caliber of competition is low in and of itself isn't going to get you relief. So there's got to be something else there. That can be a contributing factor, but if that's all you're bringing to me from a waiver perspective, unfortunately I'm going to have to tell you that that waiver is denied. What are a couple ways that you can, a couple routes that are common for relief? For our student athletes who come to us from countries where there is a mandatory military service requirement, so Israel is the most frequent. There are certainly other examples, but we see um, Israeli prospective student athletes seemingly almost weekly this time of year. So those individuals are required by their government to serve mandatory military. A lot of times in conjunction with that, um, they will participate in community service, which often takes the form of participation in athletics that would be a, a waiver situation that you'd be looking at favorable relief um, provided it meets the guidelines. You may ask why is that a different than the US, Canada? Why don't we just provide a blanket exception? It just gets a little dicier. We need to look at those on a more case-by-case -case basis and make sure we have the appropriate documentation. If you're meeting the guideline, those are slam dunk approvals, but it's not as clear cut um, as when you're looking at our military service, which is also the distinction of it not being mandatory. If you divert from the country's normal educational path, there's a guideline for that. So um, maybe there was some legitimate reason why the student deviated but wasn't necessarily required to repeat a year, which again would automatically provide relief. But if there was a legitimate reason, we would look at that. Uh, misinformation, lack of information, and institutional error. I'll give just a quick plug. We had a fourth session that was on your list um, that was really more going to be for uh, compliance administrators as, as opposed to the on-campus folks. So we'll make sure Carlin gives you that just as a resource because I don't think we'll have time to get to it today. But generally, you've got to make sure in any waiver situation, whether it's academic, legislative relief, you've got to make sure that if you're going to say misadvisement, 
you got to be ready to fall on that sword. So particularly for academic waivers, um, academic review committee just approved a directive back in February. If you say a student's not meeting a requirement because you messed up or someone at your institution messed up, be forewarned your president, your AD, your FAR, and your compliance administrator are all going to get letters notifying of the misadvisement. So um, obviously if you're a compliance officer and you're filing the waiver, you know, but best to have that conversation with the president before they get a letter. Um, to, to avoid that awkward conversation, that would just be my, my best practice tip on that one. Um, and, then, and then the more general circumstances that don't meet our guideline, if, you just need to be able to demonstrate that the reason for the delay was ultimately outside of the control of the student athlete. So we hear a lot that well, you know, we're from, we're from limited financial means. I didn't really speak English all that well, and so I couldn't get the right TOEFL score to be accepted to an American institution. And that's why I delayed enrollment for four years. That's fine. Those are all very valid reasons for delaying enrollment in college. But neither of those reasons tells me why you needed to continue to compete while you delay your enrollment, <laughs> right? So the argument of, well, yeah, I couldn't get a scholarship unless I competed in these events just reinforces the notion that you were getting better by competing all that time. So we really do need to see documentation that it was, it was necessary for the student to delay enrollment in order to provide relief. So this is just some data. I know that's pretty small and I'll go through it pretty quickly. But we got this from our eligibility center staff. And as, as you know that have been around for a little bit, the new organized competition uh, legislation came into effect in 2010. So this is information um, tracking the number of students who have registered with the eligibility center since 2010 and from what country um, they are coming from. You can see the, the huge number there is Canada. Makes sense. Um, certainly you probably feel like in terms of that's probably your highest representation as well um, would be a safe bet. So they're roughly 30% of the overall registrations that the eligibility center sees. The UK hovers right around 10%. So when you think about 40% um, at the end of the day are coming from those countries, that's a pretty big, big chunk of what the eligibility center is seeing on an annual basis. Uh, and then you, you can see the other more common countries there, Germany, Brazil, um, in Australia. Oh, I went back instead of forward. Okay, so that's also very tiny, but we'll, it'll make it be easier to see once we get the PowerPoints to you. But this just shows the number of amateurs and penalties by year. So, and then these uh, these are Division Two specific. So you can see we're actually trending down, which is a good thing. I think that's probably indicative of. Um, educational efforts, it's just better understanding of the legislation. I think our membership's doing a better job of educating, particularly our international students, um, about the legislation for organized competition to hopefully avoid penalties, because um, we're about 15, 14 year than we were back in 2010-11. And then of those amateurs and penalties, you can see the big chunk of them are organized competition. So the ones that aren't organized competition are maybe run-ins with agents, pay-for-play issues, things like that. But the, that's a very small chunk of the penalties the eligibility center is imposing as opposed to these organized competitions. So while it's very important that you educate on all of the legislation um, that can affect the student athletes' amateurism, you can certainly see that organized competition is, is the big trigger here for our eligibility center staff. So Canada, as we noted, they are the most represented uh, foreign country in eligibility center representation or registrations. Um, for, for those of you that aren't tracking on it, I loved, when I, I did initial eligibility for a while on campus, I loved Canadian students. All you gotta do is figure out the province, they got one core course list, and you just have to match up the codes. Makes it so easy. Whereas domestic students, you know, there's however many high schools there are in the United States, there's that many core lists. So it's very easy. Um, 
eligibility perspective to be looking at Canadian students. So make sure um, that you're using those, you look for those the same way you look for any domestic core course lists and they're available through the resources tab um, in order to evaluate those students. The one thing that I do want to highlight specific to Canada, who has ever had a student enroll in a CGEP program in Quebec? Only cat. That surprises me. Okay, so CGEP is a very common program that we see um, in terms of waivers and, and other questions from Canada. And what it is, is it is a program that students from Quebec can enroll in after they have completed what we consider to be traditional high school. So similar to how the United Kingdom, we'll get into this in a second, they have multiple tiers. This is essentially a second tier in Quebec. So students will enroll in this JET program, which is an acronym for French words that I won't butcher. And they have two options essentially as it relates to their graduation date. So before they enroll in CGEP, obviously they have their normal high school graduation date that's already been determined. If in their first year of CGEP, they enroll in and complete 14 courses, the student's graduation date can be advanced by one year. So they graduate from high school, May of 2013, spend 13, 14, completing 14 core subjects in CGEP, their graduation date for purposes of applying organized competition legislation is now May 2014, which means their grace period is now 14-15. Okay? The other option is, for those that are not completing the 14 core, is that they graduate from CGEP within a two-year time frame. So CGEP is a 28-course program. So the math breaks up very evenly. That's why the 14 um, number is there after year one. That's showing you're essentially making the appropriate progress that you're supposed to make. And that would advance the graduation date by two years. So again, provide flexibility for those individuals. And while they're enrolled in CGEP, they can be competing in athletics that whole time if they want. But in terms of changing the graduation date, they would have to meet those academic requirements. No, it's, the question was it's not college, or how do you really call it? It's essentially like a post-secondary. It's not college as the Canadian system defines it. Um, it's, it's a second option um, that, yeah, it's, I don't even really know. There's not an American equivalent. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's kind of prep school, but I don't even know that we would say that's certainly the best example we have, but it's it's definitely a unique um, a unique pattern. Okay, so going backwards just a little bit, um, I wanted to keep Quebec with Canada, but th this kind of overlaps. So multiple tier educational system. So Quebec is an example of that. Again, there's a very common step after high school graduation, um, but the UK and UK has had significant influence over many other countries' educational patterns, particularly um, the Caribbean is modeled very similarly. Um, anyone have students from either the Caribbean or the UK? Okay, so the CGEP concept is very similar, right? You've got multiple tiers, excuse me, in that structure that can help a student athlete, a prospective student athlete advance their grad date, which is again outlined far more clearly than I will be able to in this condensed time frame of how they can advance it. But an interpretation that was issued um, back in 2011 regarding how to determine a graduation date um, for an individual from a multiple tier educational system. So you've got the potential scenarios there and we'll go through one, each one one by one. So, and the first one is the easiest. You've got the, the PSA is complete secondary school um, in the time frame prescribed. So maybe um, it's three years, maybe it's four years, whatever that specific country says the pattern should be, student athlete meets that requirement. So the individual then enrolls in the next tier of the program. So in the UK, let's, let's say the A levels, okay? Individual in, graduates high school in time, enrolls in A levels immediately completes A-level on time. 
that's easy because you're doing exactly like you would normally do. They're, they're members of the same class all the way through. They've completed the, the tier on time. You get the appropriate um, advance on that graduation date and the grace year then obviously is moved as well. So that's the most um, clear cut and hopefully that's all you get is, that, is kids who are completely following the path. The next one is what if the PSA delays enrollment in the next tier? So we'll just, let's just keep using Quebec since we use that as an example. Student athlete graduates from high school in Quebec in 2012, May of 2012. Should theoretically enroll at CJEP in fall of 2012. He's going to be on time with his classmates. But decides to not enroll at CJEP until this 13-14 academic year. Okay. He doesn't get a benefit just because he chose to delay. So if he ultimately graduates from CJEP, he, his high school graduation date is going to be what it would have been had he enrolled on time. So essentially that closes the loophole, right? You don't get to just say, you know what, I'm just not going to start here and I'm just going to play tennis for six years and then enroll in CJEP and advance from there. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So you do have to look at how the class would normally be classified. And then the next option, student from Quebec says, you know what, I'm going to enroll right away. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Gets through one term of CJEP and says, this is not what I signed up for. No thank you. I'm done. Obviously at that point, you're reverting back to the original high school graduation date because that individual has done nothing to earn the graduation date being advanced. Hopefully that also makes sense. Okay, so that interp is really helpful. Um, again, June 30th, 2011, if you ever run into one of those scenarios, it's a great, great reference. Okay, so any questions on organized competition before we move on to transfers? Okay. So, oh, just before we, we get going on this road, down this road, um, general reminder, 14011, states that it is the institution's responsibility to certify the eligibility of its student athletes. It is not the eligibility center's responsibility to certify PTD. It is not academic and membership affairs responsibility. It is not Carlin's responsibility, which I'm sure she's very happy about. It is your institution's responsibility. I say that because a lot of times, hopefully not a lot of times, but occasionally you may run into a situation where we are asked to provide opinion. And you'll see later, our opinion is just that. It is advisory in nature. You are not bound to it. You ultimately, at the end of the day, whether it's an international student or domestic student, you are responsible for certifying that all of your student athletes are eligible. Okay, Just keep that in mind as we walk through. So, transfer student athletes who come to your institution um, from an international country, no matter what program they were enrolled in, no matter how much or how little you know about that academic program, you must treat them as a 4-4 transfer. Okay? So even if you have Canada, and Canada has structured their educational system to have um, institutions that are very similar in structure and mission to two-year institutions, and you feel like this is a 2-4 two, two, transfer, you always treat international students as 4-4 four, four transfers. Okay? You know you've got a, you're dealing with an international transfer, you know you're looking at it from a 4-4 perspective. Your blood pressure is raising because you've got a transcript from Spain. You don't know what to do with it. Just take a step back. It's really not a whole heck of a lot different other than the fact that it's not maybe in English than what you would do with a normal domestic transfer. So you've got your four steps. Did the student athlete actually enroll in a or is this just some random program that they went off and got a certificate 
and this has nothing to do with actual enrollment. If you're an athlete, you can enroll at a collegiate institution. The next question, just as you would ask for a domestic student, was the individual enrolled full time or was it part time enrollment? Because as we covered many, many hours ago at this point, if they were only enrolled part time, they never triggered transfer status. So full time is really the key there. Once you figured out if they were full time, the question, again, just like your domestics, how many terms were they enrolled full time? Because you got to know what's happening with their clock, how much time they've got left. Tennis coach found this superstar over in Latvia, and he's hoping he's got him for 10 semesters. So that's why it's really important you make sure you figure out how many you've got. And then finally, again, just as we covered transfers this morning, is the individual meeting PTD requirements? So, it as a can, can I have you pause for two seconds? So, did they enroll in a collegiate institution? What is a collegiate institution? I've got somebody here who's really paying attention and is stealing my thunder. I like it. So, we do say 14023 when we're talking about what is a collegiate institution. C in that bylaw does include an institution of higher education located in a foreign country. That doesn't necessarily help you, does it? That doesn't answer the question you just asked me. Okay, so next, what is an institution of higher education? The, the reference to is this um, credited by the Ministry of Education is going to be your number one tool. Okay, so is it officially recognized? Is this a program that traditionally individuals graduating from high school would enter into that results in some form of a diploma? Those are going to be helpful tools for you and perhaps your number one resource. Again, though, what if you're dealing with some country you can't even find a map, much less speak their language? in terms of knowing where it falls. That's admittedly where it gets to be, and I'm sure that's why people get a little bit with international transfer. But most of these institutions, just like all of your institutions these days, have websites, they have information, you can do some digging. Um, the question is, do they offer at least a one-year program of studies? So you can likely ask that from the website. Maybe your international admissions office is familiar with a particular um, country or that particular institution. And that can help you. And then does it conduct an intercollegiate athletics program? We'll get to this a little bit more in a second. That's necessarily uh, exclusively an indicator as to whether or not it's a collegiate institution. As you know, many, many foreign, or foreign countries don't sponsor intercollegiate athletics like we do. So that doesn't necessarily give any help. But if you find one that does, you, chances are you may be looking at an uh, institution of higher education. Again, the next piece of where does it fall on the educational timeline? So is it something that these students are enrolling in after secondary school? And if so, is it something that is a requirement for university or is it really truly university? So breaking that down, because just as some countries have multiple tiers of secondary school, some countries have programs that are prerequisites as entrance to university. So club sport participation, and this was going back to the question of intercollegiate athletic. Don't you shouldn't default to thinking that a team is a club team just because that's what the particular institution is calling it. You know, we, we get very accustomed to that because we're used to one of three things, right? Intercollegiate athletics, club sports, and murals. So we default to this thought of, well, club sports, we're not, we're not really worried about that generally. But again, since our educational system is largely unique in terms of how we place athletics in the framework, other countries don't necessarily call it intercollegiate athletics. Sometimes they will, they will call it club, but it is essentially the same as what we call intercollegiate athletics. So you're going to want to make sure that you're having conversations with the student. Um, again, a lot of times there's language barrier issues here. 
um, making sure that you're communicating with the institution to the best extent possible if, again, you need that piece to figure out where this falls on the timeline and what this means, as well as any potential participation that would need to count toward their four years of athletics participation. Okay? Um, I think we just covered this, but club sport participation, again, similar to the same triggers as what constitutes intercollegiate competition for us. If getting expenses to participate against club teams from other institutions, that's going to be a trigger. Um, they are getting, coaches are being paid salary, things like that. Again, the triggers that in our minds make us think of intercollegiate athletics oftentimes apply to the club sport environment um, in Europe or otherwise. So we figured out somehow, some way, we broke down the language barrier. We figured out that this is in fact a higher education institution. So next step is we're looking at was the student enrolled full time? Just as institution may have a different way of um, scheduling classes, maybe you do block schedules, maybe you do 16 week courses or eight week courses, institutions of, of international institutions can be the same way. So it's important to figure out is there a definition of full-time enrollment, again, a lot of times the website will say this information, just like your website will say that for aid purposes or, or otherwise. But a lot of times what it'll really say is, here's our standard course progression. So in your first year at this institution, you're going to take this block. And the second year, you're going to take this block. And if you're looking at a transcript and you see that Susie enrolled in the block that is exactly laid out on the website, you can feel pretty darn confident that Susie did trigger full-time enrollment. She's met the academic standards of that institution. She's following their normal course progression. Everything feels good about that. It kind of matches up. Sometimes they'll identify the number of credits attempted and earned by the student athlete, ultimately. Sometimes, we'll, um, I don't think we have the case studies in here, but sometimes you'll refer to, see them referred to as topics or subjects, things like that, that don't feel quite like we call them as courses, but it's still, they're covering that subject matter over a specified period of time that seems very familiar to us. What can be helpful here again, and I apologize for you admissions folks that I continue to send people to come see you, but your international admissions office, if you have one specifically designated or maybe you just have a guru in the admissions office that frequently deals with international students, can oftentimes look at a transcript and say, you know what, based on what this individual completed, we're going to bring this student in and award 30 hours of credit. And how that works in our framework, I think I'm skipping ahead a little bit, how it works in our framework is that starts to feel like two full-time terms, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a student who took 15 and 15, that's pretty reasonable at your institution. And so if your admissions office has determined that's how many credits they're going to transfer in, even if maybe the program doesn't do a great job defining for you what full-time really is at that institution, you can feel like that's an appropriate um, assessment to make for that. They've been enrolled at that point for two full-time terms based on the number of credits that are going to be coming in. The key there is you're also going to want to be looking at not just completed but attempted. So that example presumes that that student has passed all the classes that they, they attempted and, and earned 30. Um, if it was attempted 45 and only earned 30, then maybe you're looking at three terms. So your admissions office can really be your best friend on this one. And then again, on the PCD piece. So are they coming in for right now with the six hours of transferable degree credit in 2016 and beyond, obviously the nine in the last full-time term of enrollment. This is potentially where you hit your stumbling block. So maybe you've identified, maybe it's been smooth sailing 
process, you figured out it's a higher education institution, you figured out full-time terms, you know the kids used four, but maybe just based on the classes that they were taking, your institution is not gonna be able to certify that Johnny is coming in with six transferable credits. Then you're just looking at a progress toward degree waiver, maybe with some mitigation of the educational pattern in that country or whatever the case may be. That makes sense? Okay. So, yeah. Um, so the, the common transfer exceptions that we will see as it relates to transfer students and similar to what we discussed this morning, the one-time transfer exception. So the key thing here on the one-time transfer exception is that the certification in writing that the previous institution does not object only applies to NCAA and NAIA institutions. So you no longer have to track down somebody in Germany who has no idea what you're talking about to sign off on use of the one-time transfer exception. So hopefully that's welcome news. Um, you can essentially just default grant it to the student on your own. Discontinued non-sponsored sport exception. Uh, again, if you've been able to verify that there is no version of intercollegiate athletics or club sports, however they refer to it, at the international institution, you could apply that particular exception. Um, and perhaps less commonly is the exchange student exception. I don't know how many of you have exchange student, student athletes, um, but that such an exception exists for those individuals as well to be certified as immediately eligible. Um, yeah, and there's some more information about that. So they do have to be actually um, sponsored by their government, our State Department, or Rotary or, or a similar organization like that. Um, and it has to be identified prior to the departure from their home country. So if they just show up and they're saying, I'm an exchange student, you're not really an exchange student. You haven't gone through this whole process. Um, so again, you're probably able to use the other two before you even start looking at this particular exception, but it does exist um, in case you ever do need it. So a couple of quick case studies. I do have one, or a couple. Um, Zach. Zach is a prospect from Liberia. He completed secondary school in June 2011. And during the 2011-12 academic year, Zach attended the Education Ministry's Department of Youth and Sports. During that year, he completed a coaching certificate program and it is a full-time one-year program. So Zach wasn't doing anything else during that year other than going to this coaching certificate program. So this is the document that Zach gave you. Um, you're very impressed by the fact that he earned the common part to the state degree of athletic educator of first degree, whatever that means. Um, but it certainly sounds like Zach's pretty fancy. So you've got that to work with, and you can see the, the date that that was awarded. So the first question, is it a collegiate institution? So you've done some digging. Um, again, it was identified as being part of, of this particular ministry in Liberia. Um, and it's a one-year coaching certificate program that occurs after secondary school. This coaching certificate is the only thing individuals can earn through this program. Nothing else is offered. And it's not required for Zach to have completed this program should he ultimately want to enroll in a Liberian university. Okay, so that, that's the background digging that you did. Well, I guess I just kind of showed you the answer, sorry. <laughs> Long day. Um, so uh, our advisory opinion on this is that Zach has not triggered transfer status in this scenario. This is not an institution of higher ed. It's a one-off certificate program that he went and, and learned how to coach, but it's not truly under the umbrella of a collegiate institution. So in this case, we advise the institution, hey, Zach's gotta go through the eligibility center and he better be meeting all the initial eligibility requirements in order to be academically out. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody have any transfers from France? Nope. Okay. 
Um, a, a very common program we see is the French CNED program, which is another acronym that um, I won't butcher, but it's essentially their distance education program. It is nationally administered. Their Ministry of Education runs it. It is very common for French students to come over to the United States having enrolled in this program. So knowing that, we already know that CNED is a collegiate institution. Okay, so we're, we're, we've gone past step one, and now we're concerned about Wendy um, and her full-time terms. So Wendy sends you this, which I, I know is kind of probably hard to see in the back, but this column here is classes, which they actually refer to as topics in the CNED program. You'll see the number of homeworks which it's, a, it's essentially an exam-based program, so they're calling homeworks what we would really call exams. Um, and you can see her grades with the class average and all of that. Um, and, and she's done pretty well here. Grade in CNED based on her performance. So coach is excited. Wendy's clearly somewhat smart. She's passed to, on to the next grade. And she's really good at gymnastics. So you better get her eligible stat. So again, CNED program actually does not define academic terms as we normally do um, at our institutions. However, she did complete those 11 topics in essentially that calendar year. And when your new best friend in the International Admissions Office evaluated this transcript, they said, we're pretty familiar with CNED. We've seen a couple um, non-student athletes come from France. And based on her completion of these 11 topics, we are awarding her 30 semester hours of credit. What do we think about Wendy? How many terms is she using? Two, yes. So we, w we advise this institution that in this case, Wendy is in fact a transfer student athlete. She enrolled full time in CNED, um, which we feel very comfortable with calling a collegiate institution. And based on the fact that she's ultimately going to come into your institution with 30 hours, that's essentially the equivalent of two full time terms. Any questions on that one? Yeah, so, so the question is, what if, what if Wendy um, was competing while she was enrolled here in CNED? So two, two kind of prongs with that. Um, if it was actually a part of the institution, which in this case it probably wouldn't since it's distance ed, but let's say it was actually administered by the institution um, and it was kind of met our definition of intercollegiate athletics, we would say that in addition to using two semesters on her 10 semester clock, she then would have also used a season of competition. Now, if, Su if Wendy, whatever her name is in this scenario, um, if, if Wendy, let's say she completed high school, let me get this right. Yeah, she completed high school in 2011, same May. So we know her grace period for purposes of organized competition is 11-12. Is well, she enrolled right away. So she actually didn't delay enrollment in any way. And if she continues to compete in gymnastics meets as outside competition, she wouldn't be subject to the organized competition legislation because that is only during the gap in which you graduate from high school and enroll full time at a collegiate institution. So if it was outside competition, provided she doesn't have other amateurism issues, pay for play and all that, she'd be fine. Yeah, so she'd come to your institution, conceivably, in that scenario, with eight semesters remaining to use four seasons of eligibility. Great question. So resources and best practices. Um, again, your international admissions officers are, are a wealth of information. Um, credit evaluation companies, for those of you that work in the admissions office, I'm sure you're far more familiar with the names of these than I am. Um, but there are companies that will evaluate international transcripts for you. 
to help provide an additional determination. Um, by all means, feel free to use those. Um, you know, you're always a little leery when you add a third party into the process of making sure that you're truly um, choosing a reputable site, a re reputable organization, one that is really truly providing you an unbiased expert opinion um, and not just one that what you want to hear <laughs> um, and that you're getting what you paid for, so to speak. Already covered, the NCA staff can, is certainly here for an advisory opinion. Um, certainly you can submit questions through RSRO. Um, and we can run that up to the International Student Records Committee as necessary should there be additional questions. Again, they ultimately can only provide an advisory opinion, but their advisory opinion is likely going to be infinitely more valuable than that of NCA staff, just due to the background knowledge and expertise that those committee members have. Um, in terms of nominating individuals to that committee, it's ensured that there is an appropriate representation of knowledge. So we don't have six people on that committee who all specialize in African nations. There's an individual who's very strong in Africa, but also one who knows a lot about how Asia is structured and the various countries there. So there's, there's a great amount of knowledge on that committee um, should you ultimately truly be in a bind. But again, as I kicked off this segment with, it is ultimately your institutional responsibility to certify these individuals. So we can provide advisory opinions all day long, and at the end of the day, if you disagree, by all means, you just have to be able to document that in good faith, you certified that individual um, based on the information available to you, and you truly believed that individual to be eligible under whatever analysis you used, um, should some competitor down the street ask the question as to how Wendy got eligible. Um, I think we kind of covered all that, but the, the last bullet point is the big one. Hopefully your coaches aren't naive to the fact that international transfers are kind of a different beast, but the more you can reinforce that, just to be totally honest, to give you more time. You know you've got to do more analysis on these types of situations. It's not a different analysis than domestic students. It just requires a little more legwork and doesn't really help you in compliance admissions, registrar or otherwise, if they come to you on August 1 and say, oh yeah, I've been recruiting this kid from Liberia since January and just told you about it. I mean, they, they need to be looping you in early um, with all the information that they have and getting those transcripts ASAP so you have more time to really make sure the student has a chance of being eligible. Contact information, again, there are kind of two different pieces. So if you're looking solely from an initial eligibility perspective, um, or actually I should also include there the amateurism certification, that all goes through our eligibility center staff. So you're gonna wanna make sure you're contacting our international experts in that office. If you have questions relating to transfer or PTD certification of international transfers, that will come through AMA. So submitting those through RSRO um, is gonna be your best way to get an answer there.